What's going on everybody? Welcome back to another video. Today we are talking all about the architecture of Analyst Builder. So we're gonna be diving into the tech stack, how we actually built it, um, and we'll kind of be talking about some of our design choices as well. Uh, Kasun is gonna be talking the vast majority of the time, right? Because you know he made a lot of the choices uh, and we you know did a lot of the research deciding which one to go with. Um, so we have a ton of stuff that we're gonna get into. This could potentially be a long video. But I, you know, I walked through this process with you, but I'm still gonna ask a lot of questions because I find it really fascinating. And I'm sure these are questions that you would have as well. So let's go ahead and get started. We're gonna start out with uh, just the general tech stack. And then we'll dive into, I think, some more nuanced, difficult things like AWS security, uh, microservices, and things like that. But let's talk a little bit about our tech stack. So. Um, we have Node.js and a little bit about why we chose that versus others. Yeah, it's a funny story <laughs> that uh, I actually didn't want to do this in Node.js. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to do this in a language called Elixir. Actually, we built the first first prototype of remote code Correct. execution engine in Elixir. <laughs> right. But that was a challenge uh, because recruiting people with Elixir was super hard. Mm -hmm. You can't find Elixir engineers. You have to build them. Mm -hmm. And we didn't have much of time like doing that. So we thought, okay, uh, we were really good at Node.js and we selected that. And for that, we used a framework called Nest.js. Uh, Nest is uh, something like ASP.NET or, you know, it's very structured uh, uh, in a way to build scalable enterprise software. So if you haven't, if you have used Things like Spring Boot in Java, uh, .NET platform uh, with ASP, uh, also uh, things like Laravel. Uh, this is very similar to that, and uh, it helped us like structure software in a very modularized manner. So we use that uh, without using, uh, you know, without building it our own. Mm -hmm. uh, so. Uh, we uh, even though this Nest.js also was, you know, it has a certain ways to do some some things. So it has it had some learning curve. So initially we had to like define a good architecture for that. Uh, even they had you know some basic scaffolding, but I found that it might be not really good going forward. So we had to spend some time designing it in the way we want uh, for our project. So the reason for using Node.js is like, uh, you know, it is one thing we know really well and it works really well also. And uh, it also has certain advantages uh, since it is using a single threaded event loop uh, to execute uh, the code inside. Uh, so it's also helped us like, you know, write software without uh, having synchronization issues. So that was a plus point. And also, a lot of people know Node.js these days, so we could hire people and we could train people to use it. Uh, it would, it was like a great advantage at that time. And also, uh, there were like a lot of support uh, libraries which supported Node.js and Nest.js. So it was like, you know, it was like an easy path to going on. Mm -hmm. And in future, maybe we'll switch into next year <laughs> because I really want to do that. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. Um, the next part of our tech stack is Vercel. Now, uh, we've talked about it a thousand times. And so I, to kind of set it up for you, what do you like about Vercel and why do we choose it versus are we going to keep using it in the future? What are some of like the downsides of using it? Yeah. Or what is Vercel first for people who don't know? Yeah, so let's uh, go with from the front end side. For the front end side, we used React JS. Uh, actually, it wasn't my first choice. I wanted to do this in Vue JS, yeah. but there were like certain problems uh, when we starting the project because uh, you know that this project has server side rendering. Uh, that you see that some pages loads instantly, uh, like pricing page and courses page. So they had like something called static server-side generation, we, which we use our API to pull up data from the API and build the page uh, before it loads to the browser in a server and cache it. Mm -hmm. So it won't happen 
frequently right so it loads really fast so for that we used a framework called Next.js and Next is working really well only with Vercel. Mm -hmm. That was a main problem because they created that and uh, you know you can host it uh, in different platforms like in Docker, in Netlify, others but it doesn't work really well as it works in Vercel. Mm -hmm. So we had like initially uh, we had like go, go with that uh, because uh, they were like fast, uh, you can just deploy things, you can get deployed previews, and it was helping our testing process uh, in a really good way that yeah. we could do a lot of stuff, like uh, before we like... Uh, pushed it to staging or production. Pushed staging, yeah. We, can, we could preview that, what right. was going to happen, and uh, we could like eliminate a lot of bugs before it is getting merged to the main code base. So it helped a lot. Mm -hmm. And also it has like a good infrastructure, uh, so we didn't have to worry a lot of, about a lot of things, but going forward, I would say we would stick Verzel. We would uh, choose something like Open Next, which is uh, running on AWS Lambda, which is much cheaper than Verzel on a scale mm -hmm. because uh, on scale it is going to cost us a lot, and we don't want that to happen. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, the things I didn't like about them was like. You know, sometimes uh, they weren't very responsive. That they were, they had their own problems. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the downtimes and other stuffs, which uh, caused some problems for us in the past, and also uh, something I don't really like about the pricing structure. But initially, it was a good deal, yeah. uh, as I suggested you. Uh, yeah, so that is the reason we had to use Vercel because we use Next.js, which works really great with Vercel and. As for my knowledge, that is the only good way to like run it uh, without having a lot of troubles because yeah. they keep changing the architecture in next years and others can't keep up with it before they do. Uh, so we had like deal with them. I mean, uh, to get latest features into production and also uh, the front end infrastructure. We we hosted it in Vercel actually, so. Uh, it like uh, eliminated the need of like managing servers for ourselves mm -hmm. and we could lead them to do that their magic there uh, because they have like a very complicated infrastructure to like host an application uh, mm -hmm. so we had to like use them utilize them to like have like a better use experience for the others uh, mm -hmm. than using uh, any other alternatives mm -hmm. so initially it was a good one because uh, the setup time was very low yeah. we didn't have like you know, spend a lot of time on that. We could just do it. And uh, it integrated really well to our uh, system. Yeah, no, I agree. It, it it definitely was has been really good. Um, like the preview is probably one of my favorite things about it just because we, like you said, you don't have to merge it with your main code and then retract it if it's bad, which is, you know, very frustrating. You can just get a preview of it and look at it. And then if you like it, then you push it, which is, I think, one of the neatest things. The next thing, uh, next part of our tech stack is uh, a really interesting one. And I think you're going to like talking about this a lot because we've talked about this so much before. Um, so, and we use, we're going to talk about Supabase and Firebase. Um, now we use these for a few different things, but one of the main things is authentication, right? Um, uh, to give a preview, we started out with Firebase and we no longer use Firebase. We switched over at, during beta. This is after we had already launched. We switched from Firebase to Supabase, which was a, a probably the biggest change that we made uh, to the arc, uh, to our tech stack after we launched. Yeah. So you want to talk about what Supabase does or both of them do and why we decided to switch. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Initially, when we started in the project, uh, we wanted to handle uh, we wanted to offload the authentication to some third party provider yeah. because we didn't want like store any passwords or any other stuffs uh, in our service so initially we selected firebase uh, it wasn't very bad when we were testing it out right yes but <laughs> when good. we pushed it to production we got a lot of issues mm -hmm. from different people they have you know extensions enabled that blocks the login sometimes it keeps hanging sometimes you can't even log in yeah like it was like really hard to even like to like look at look at it and 
you know <laughs> it, it was, was hard to look at yeah <laughs> it was horrible and this is like one of the biggest surprise we had yes because initially we thought that the bottleneck would be the swim out code execution engine yes and the other things but they were working perfectly fine mm-hmm. but the firebase side they were having a lot of issues like weight limiting issues people couldn't actually even log into their account sometimes yeah in an oh Another thing on top of that was when somebody was already logged in, when they would leave the site and come back, we wanted to auto log them in. But sometimes it wouldn't, or sometimes it would take a while. It would take like two, three, four seconds, which is way too long. Yeah. We want it to be much more instantaneous, much more fluid. And that Firebase, it caused a lot of issues. And that was probably the single biggest thing that, biggest issue that we had when we launched beta. Yeah. Was people logging in, couldn't log in to their account. Um, e- they couldn't register right or it just was so many issues so many issues like we uh, the the worst part with firebase was we couldn't even debug what's going on like Correct. for example if the email is not sending we couldn't see it anywhere mm-hmm. the most of the time that's right that was i forgot about that because someone would register and they'd get an email to confirm that they're that person but they would never get the email and so they couldn't log in yeah that was so that was horrible and also there were like certain Issues with this Firebase because we couldn't customize things mm-hmm. as we wanted to like the branding stuff. And actually uh, before the beta, we wanted to actually switch mm-hmm. to the Superbase, but it it could have delayed. It, it, yeah, it would have delayed it for another couple weeks or a month. And I was like, no. <laughs> this was, the, in the previous video we talked about, we disagreed on some things. Some day, yeah. This was one of our disagreements. I said, no, I know there's going to be issues, but... I would rather launch and have people start using it and give us feedback than take another month to make this change, which ended up being really important. Now we're, we made the change. Um, but okay, so now now we no longer use Firebase. Now we use Superbase. And and why? how has that experience been since we've switched? Yeah, Superbase is an open source competitor to Firebase. They have like every component open source. So we use their platform, like their hosted platform to do authentication and host our databases. And mainly the biggest uh, advantage I see of uh, Firebase was that uh, they uh, kind of have like, you know, a lot of authentication providers and they allow us to customize every single step Mm -hmm. along the way. So we can do whatever we want in the branding of the emails and everything. And also they have like a a way for doing the authentication without um, you know, causing a lot of troubles because in Firebase it was causing troubles almost <laughs> every single time For when so there were users. like a lot of users uh, trying yeah. to log in. Yeah. So, but with Superbase it was like very smooth. Mm-hmm. We don't get like much of these issues with login anymore. We have sometimes, some time to time, but very it is very, um, you know, less. Mm-hmm. Like it's almost like nothing. Yeah. So, when we switched to that, uh, we could also enable a lot of login providers like as such as LinkedIn without any issues yeah. because initially we didn't have LinkedIn mm-hmm. uh, when we launched uh, the analyst builder mm-hmm. and uh, there was like problems with tweet, uh, GitHub sometimes yeah. uh, which is not working in the Spire base. Yeah, it wasn't it working at all. wasn't working at all but for some people it worked. <laughs> it was really rare. 95% of people could not get GitHub to work but like you said now with Superbase we have all of those, all of those, which is it really it's a user very user friendly to be able to log in with Google, Twitter, or X, um, LinkedIn, GitHub, whatever they want to log in with, and just to I, I'm kind of interjecting. What I like about Superbase is we have all the data on the back end, but we don't store any of we, we we don't store any of the passwords or any of their information. So we if anything were to happen, which I don't think is going to happen. We don't have any data that ties to a single to a person where they could use it in any way. Yeah. So it's really nice. Yeah, and also that since Superbase use a compound called GoTru, uh, which is an open source uh, authentication provider, uh, we can even self host it if we want later. Mm-hmm. So it is also an advantage, and the data, uh, the way they store it, it is not cryptic. So we can use that. Like if we want to like switch from super based or something else it is very possible with them because yeah. they have these options so and actually the pricing was also super good like uh, for like 50k users you can have it like around like 25 dollars i guess for 
month and it was like a really good deal i guess yeah. and uh, it also host our databases so it was like a really good deal for yeah. us uh, because they manage everything and we don't have like worry about anything else yeah and uh, also it was like very fast compared to firebase this authentication was like super fast compared mm-hmm. to what we had with firebase and people really loved that yeah. after we introduced it and the authentication system was very flexible and very you know responsive and uh, people uh, were like loving that from from the day one we introduced it uh and i think that uh, they are doing like a great job like introducing new things uh, and we really we should really thank them uh for like creating this amazing platform which is completely open source mm-hmm. so yeah so that's why we use superbase we use it for authentication and we use it for databases and we will use it for like our future projects as well yeah. uh, the fu- uh, the future uh improvements the new features we going to introduce we will use superbase infrastructure for that yeah yeah it's and we used it for the free version for a while but we liked it enough and we had more enough users that we had we wanted to upgrade so that all really worked out um so yeah the that that whole process was definitely like it was that when we first launched that was the toughest thing about having thousands of users who all were having login issues yes not fun it was not fun, not fun. um So in the next part of our um tech stack is GitHub. Now, um we used the free version of GitHub for a long time. Now we've well exceeded uh uh how much code we're using and pushing and and uh now we have to pay for it. And so we use GitHub a ton. Um how are we using it for both just our code base but also other things as well? Yeah, so we basically use GitHub because uh it is slow you know that uh, it is very popular for like hosting uh, code bases and also it has a lot of features uh, not only like hosting your code but you can do reviews in a nice uh, way and also they provide ci cd called github actions and they were like super flexible so you can write very complicated pipeline uh, which is uh, which can be used to like push your code uh, from the code base to the production server or staging uh, so we were like, utilizing the platform fully and uh, after some point uh, we wanted like to do more things like uh, do review request approval so we had to like switch into like the paid version of github and uh, that's the reason we using and this this uh, github uh, actions they were, uh, they are like very tied to the github platform so we could do a lot of things with that uh, you know when we were in the code it helped us to like do certain things uh, formattings and other stuffs and also when um, pushing artifacts it also helped us in doing it in a very swift manner which since it is integrated into github very tightly mm-hmm. we could do a lot of uh, you know fancy stuffs with it uh, so that's the reason we use it and uh, from my experiences uh, github is very responsive most of the time they they sometimes have little down times but it works almost 99% time yeah so and it is very simple to use and a lot of people are familiar with it so we went with github and uh, yeah so that's about it i guess yeah yeah i think you, you covered all of it now the next two are ones that i think are probably the most interesting um and not every website or plot company uses these which i think is what makes it even more interesting so the next two that we have are kubernetes and docker um can you explain what those are and how they fit in with our platform and what they do yeah so they are like two different things mm-hmm. docker is uh, you can think of it as simply a virtual machine but it is not a virtual machine mm-hmm. you can think of it as it basically docker is like uh, you know it's like a platform where you can execute uh, you know you can run programs without actually running them in your host machine so it acts like a virtual machine mm-hmm. but inside what it does is it is running your program in an isolated uh, way so can go into like more details like it is using something called c groups in linux and uh, using that uh, you can limit the access to the right. outside world so it, the process, like sandboxing yeah, essentially like sandboxing so you can give it certain access levels like you can give it the limits uh, of how much ram you can 
consume or how much CPU time you get and also the file system access. Mm -hmm. So you can control everything uh, with the C groups and actually uh, Docker is actually an engine which is using these technologies in Linux uh, operating system uh, to make it something universal and now there are like alternatives for Docker. Uh, it's called OCI, uh, Open Container Initiative. So, uh, but basically we are using Docker because it is uh, very easy to use with, you know, day-to-day -day life uh, in the development process. All right, let's go on to our next piece of our tech stack, which is Docker. Yeah, we use Docker for like almost everything in our platform. Uh, so basically Docker is like a way you can package software. So I think that you have seen like that, like you can download an installer and you can run mm -hmm. but when you having a system it contains much more than a single component mm -hmm. it has like it may have databases it may have other you know caching make uh, providers like redis and also queues like rabbit mq so we need to like pack these things in a certain way it might need some library some you know some sort of uh, additional software to run the, uh, run the system correctly. So Docker is a way you can package and manage your software. So we use it for like two things, two main things. One is uh, hosting our normal API in infrastructure. So uh, it is just a very normal thing. You, you can see that uh, in like almost everyone doing it that, that way. So you can just package your software, this, for example, this Node.js API, you can package it as a Docker image and then you can run it. And the other thing is that Docker allows you to do isolation. So this is one key part of, you know, remote code execution mm -hmm. because you need to do sandboxing. So Docker uses something called namespaces and C groups in Linux kernel, uh, which allows us to like you know, the programs will run in their own world. So they don't have access to other programs or uh, installing down the system uh, because uh, they've been controlled by these uh, features of the kernel. And Docker is a way you can easily access them. So we use that for uh, doing remote code execution because one thing we want to do is like we need to, you know, disable the file system access and uh, disallowing users to do weird stuff. <laughs> uh, so we use Docker for that, uh, for mainly doing sandboxing and also packaging our software. So we use it in two main different ways. Yeah, yeah. And that's, I think, the, the one that I see the most is definitely the sandboxing with the code because when you give people access to code, in a website, you're giving them access to backend databases and systems, and you have to be able to control it, and that sandboxing is really important for that. Yes. Uh, the next one is Kubernetes. Yeah, so you can pack software in Docker images, but you need to way to run it. So there are like many ways to like run a Docker image uh, in a cloud environment. So you can use Docker Swarm, and uh, the Kubernetes is another alternative. But the Kubernetes is much more complicated than Docker Swarm and it allows you to do a lot of things, a mm -hmm. lot of things in a cloud environment because uh, it allows us like provisioning virtual machines uh, on demand. And uh, we will talk a bit about this in AWS right. section, but basically it allows us to like do the deployments and um, it, it uh, we move a lot of manual work mm -hmm. from our uh, DevOps pipelines uh, because it can automate a lot of things. Uh, like uh, it can do deployments in a very automated manner. Yeah, it can also easily do like upgrades to system software which is running uh, without having a downtime. Mm -hmm. So that is one major thing uh, of using Kubernetes. And uh, that's the that's the thing we uh, that's the reason we use Kubernetes on this and there was another one uh, that we could if we didn't have these uh, Python executors and our runner databases we wouldn't 
maybe use Kubernetes because we could host it in somewhere else, uh, which allows automatic scaling. But we had some specific need that we need to have the control of everything we uh, do in this environment. So we had to use Kubernetes for that uh, yeah. because it allows us to have like a cost efficient way managing our software uh, by doing a lot of automations and uh, having it streamlined with the process. Yeah, per I think that's a perfect, I could not have said it even close to as good as that. <laughs> um, all right, so now we're getting out of our general tech stack. Um, we're gonna talk a well, and everything else is around infrastructure and tech stack, but that's like the core of it, I think. Um, the next thing that we have is uh, kind of our basic architecture. And then I have a note, which is monolith versus microservices. Um, and I'm just going to hand that over to you because I know you can talk about that all day. <laughs> yeah. Like nowadays you can see this, there's a trend toward like doing everything in microservices. I have seen um, with this, uh, with a lot of people are like all complicating their systems, but I'm more of like a traditional person. So I didn't want to break this down to microservices because we had a lot of things. We have a lot of modules. What is a microservice? Oh, microservice is a way you can, you know, split the software into different services. So let's say, for example, let's take analyst builder. So we have, you know, a one which runs the courses, one which is working with the questions, um, uh, some module also working with the billing. We could split them into different services and we have to make them talk to each other. Yeah. So this is one way to develop in software. But we want, we went on a very different way. We use a traditional monolithic architecture, which contains everything. Mm -hmm. But we do did the small split there, uh, splitting into like two services. One is handling all the business logic, like billing, uh, getting you the access, or uh, working with the causes and questions. But we split it in middle. Uh, we isolated the remote code execution because uh, we wanted to scale it differently mm -hmm. uh, than the monolithic uh, application. Uh, and also we wanted to have, you know, it was like a design decision uh, I made because uh, when you were doing development, uh, you don't need to actually run the remote code execution engine all the time. Mm -hmm. You don't need it. So it also helped us to like speed up our development process because uh, we could like uh, have remote code execution working completely isolated from the main system. And uh, also it allowed us to like, uh, you know, have some better flexibility uh, when we go into scaling and uh, other things. Because uh, you know that uh, these uh, APIs, they scale differently than the remote code execution engine. Mm -hmm. So they are like a balance between them. So we split uh, it that way. So we call it Odin, uh, the, the remote code execution <laughs> engine, yeah. because I love Greek uh, mythology. So I wanted to, oh, so it's not Greek, it's Nos, <laughs> right, right. Nos mythology. So I, I love Nos mythology. So I thought that Odin is a great name for like, you know, because remote code execution in, in is the core of analyst build and yeah, audit makes sense. Yeah. yeah. So this audit engine, uh, it is the only thing we, we did like a split. So it is very different from, you know, traditional microservice architecture because they split by domain, mm -hmm. but we didn't do that. We have all our uh, core business logic running in one server and our remote code execution, which is running completely isolated from that uh, for, you know, better scaling and also better development uh, process. Mm -hmm. So that's the reason we we use a traditional monolith and it worked really well. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's not something that I really knew anything about. Uh, so it's, it's inter I'm also learning right now because that, that piece I really didn't fully understand. Uh, just how, why we chose that versus microservices. I didn't really understand, but now I do. So uh, I'm learning something too. Um, the next piece of our architecture is our videos, because the videos are a big piece of it. Um, and I just noticed that we didn't have a section just for the remote code execution engine. What it is, 
kind of said kind of how it works. But if we have time at the end, we'll talk about it. But mm -hmm. um, video hosting is a big piece of it because we do courses and we do other things. And so, um, you know, the videos are just pieces of content that we need to put on the platform. Now, I'll talk about this for just a little bit and then I'll hand it over to you, which is uh, initially when we were a little bit lower funding, uh, we were thinking about using just YouTube uh, as a, like to host our videos. But then, you know, after you watch a video, then at the end, you get recommendations for other platforms or other videos, and it just wasn't great. Um, and so right now we use Vimeo. Now, there were a lot of other options. Why did we choose Vimeo over their other options or hosting it ourselves even? Yeah, basically, I think Vimeo is like one of the most popular platform, like hosting your courses and other stuff. So we initially uh, look at them and uh, their pricing was fine, I guess, uh, initially. And I think they changed the pricing in the middle of the way we were doing the uh, platform. <laughs> yes. Uh, I think that was a problem for a lot of people also at that time. But uh, the other competitors, if we look at look at them, Vimeo has some, you know, a solid way for hosting these videos. So since our videos weren't like very super long and um, it was uh, just the right fit mm -hmm. and also it didn't include any ads or whatsoever. Right. So we could, uh, we also had like a great video player from them and also they had like a great API so we could easily integrate that. And uh, in future, we might be able to like look into like different providers, but for now, I guess it is doing a super great job. Yeah, but there were like few incidents, like for some countries, it was kind of right. banned. We didn't know it beforehand. Correct. Uh, <laughs> I forgot about that. Yeah, some countries, they the videos just don't work. Don't they're like, work. they're they're blocked on Vimeo. Block on Vimeo. So we know, we knew it very recently. Yeah. Some people were complaining that. So yeah. It's great. It's great for like a start mm -hmm. and um, and also like building our own infrastructure is very complicated thing and we didn't want to reinvent the wheel exactly. uh, with the time frame. But in future we can consider that. But for now I guess uh, Vimeo is like uh, one of the best platform to do it. It works really well. <laughs> yeah, there's no reason to build it. Like you said, there's no reason to reinvent the wheel at this point. Yeah. Um, for the price point, it, it works really well. And we we I think we you know, we're not spending an insane amount. And so yes. it's like 120 bucks. So it's not like it's breaking the bank. Yes. Right. To build it ourselves would take a long time. That's a lot of money invested. Yeah. Um, all right. So we have a few other things we want to cover, starting with security. Um, and, and just for the notes, uh, which is, whoops, keeping our code base safe, allowing users to input code. Um, and then, you know, a little bit about how we keep information and our database safe yeah so basically uh one thing that with the remote code execution like you give a lot of freedom for people to mm -hmm. do some certain things so one way to like limit the freedom is using docker but it is not doing everything for you so you have to do certain things mm -hmm. to like prevent uh, users doing you know random stuff so for that we uh, for example if we take python we do some processing internally before you execute the code. So it's not just you just type your code in your normal um, Python environment. We do some uh, analyzing of the code and uh, we disallow some things. So we had to do some uh, work there. Um, and also uh, the other things like uh, about the databases and they are like pretty normal stuff that uh, you have like the database is internal to the system. Uh, so it cannot be accessed outside. All right, so the next thing we're gonna talk about is AWS. Now we use AWS for quite a few things. So I'm gonna kind of break it up into three chunks. Um, the first one is just why we chose AWS, um, kind of what it does for us versus why we didn't go with something like a Google Cloud Platform or Azure. Yeah, so we use AWS for like hosting our infrastructure. Uh, the main reason we went with AWS was their Kubernetes engine. Mm -hmm. uh, that's a, the, AWS has this EKS Kubernetes engine, which is actually, it has a lot of features uh, we are using right now. Uh, one of them was called Carpenter, uh, which helped us to like, how like create like a very dynamic cluster. So the, I think in, in like a previous video we discussed about, we didn't know how much the load would gonna be. Right. And when I was like checking out the 
other platforms, I felt that they don't even address this thing. That you can create a cluster with certain type of nodes, nodes by by nodes, I mean virtual machines, and you can scale that group up. So that's the way how it traditionally done. But in AWS, you have a lot of options for virtual machines. Mm -hmm. They have on-demand virtual machine and spot virtual machines. And they have a thing called Fargate, which is uh, also like a, contain, uh, a, run, uh, a platform for like uh, having a containerized application running. And you can mix these things with uh, EKS uh, this, uh, and the Carpenter. So we use Carpenter to like, uh, since like uh, I was initially asking Alex like, about like how many users we will get uh, from the launch and he also didn't have an idea like <laughs> we we don't know yeah. we don't know how much uh, we're gonna get in like a single time like once we launch how much they are gonna be at simultaneously so and I was like initially thinking about you know uh, having some controlled Kubernetes cluster with some minimal nodes and adding scaling it up and down but there's a problem that we had to do it manually because we don't know the load and that's what normally what other people do and then i got to know about this carpenter which is a provisioning engine used by aws uh, for aws and it is helping us to do this dynamically it looks at the load and then it dynamically provisions virtual machine in different categories to minimize the cost so it actually allows us to run this uh, platform in a very scalable way and also it reduces the cost. So this is the one, one of the things I, I really love about AWS because they allow us this option which we don't have to do anything. We just keep need to focus on the our application and data service and reducing the cost. And also we use AWS for our resource hosting that uh, the files and images we are using that so it was like a great choice um, to keep everything together in one place and also we are using aws to uh, store our docker images in uh, ecr elastic container registry so it also type wells with the um, eks engine so it works really well mm -hmm. and also we are using aws for our certificate generation which is we using a uh, puppeteer for like certificate generation and we're using AWS Lambda for that. So it is also a part of our stack already. And also inside this EKS Kubernetes cluster, we run the Python executors and also we run our database systems, which is you use for like do remote code execution on, you know, MS SQL, MySQL, Postgres, they're all running on the Kubernetes engine. And, uh, uh, about python runners uh, we are running it on on demand nodes mainly so we can like define the way how to you know uh, how to deploy these things uh, in a very complicated way so which reduces the cost at the end and also gives up uh, us the maximum performance mm -hmm. uh, without sacrificing you know a lot of time on investing the load and everything else so yeah. that's the whole aws story and it works really well and it uh, they provide like really fast virtual machines and the services are really great they have like a great uptime so we don't have to worry about them at all actually yeah and uh, it works really well i guess uh, yeah we, we've had a really i think we've had a really good experience with aws it, i will say though there it was very complex like it, a lot of the stuff we're talking about for the for the tech stack and just the infrastructure we're talking about it like this is how we do it but it took a long time to really piece everything together figure things out figure out it here's exactly how to do it um this was not like a short process it was a lot of trial and error and fixing so with, even with aws i know we had a lot of issues with getting it to work consistently and then also it all working together. It was it was just tough to do for a long time. But now you've you know really made it work as a good system and as a good and now it's a huge part of Analyst Builder. I don't think um, there are other like we were talking about earlier. There is Google Cloud Platform and Azure. Why were the what were the reasons why we went with AWS versus the other ones? I think uh, compared to other platforms, as I've seen, AWS has like really great stability. 
and also with the price point, uh, it's a really good deal for us. Now, one thing that I didn't write down that's super, super important, and we've talked a lot about it, but I don't think we've talked about what exactly what it is. We keep saying remote code execution engine, but we haven't really, some people may be watching this not understand what that is. So what is it and what does it do on our platform? Yeah, so this is the core of the analyst builder. Yeah. Uh, basically what it does is like, when you submit some code, whether it is Python or SQL, it is going through this remote code execution engine and uh, it is responsible for like, de uh, delegating the task to designate a worker. So it can be, if you like doing it with Python, it would go to a Python worker, which is taking the code and doing the processing and executing it. So these Python uh, workers, they would analyze your code and uh, execute it. And if you're running the SQL code, the remote code execution engine is responsible for analyzing it and executing it. So we do a lot of pre-processing and post-processing when you execute a code. So that is what basically this remote execu uh, code execution engine work. And I will say though, we built you and your team built that from scratch because we there are products out there that would allow you to do that and integrate it into the platform, but we chose not to just purchase it. We chose to build it ourselves. Why did we build it ourselves versus pay uh, these other platforms or tools or applications that we could just integrate it into the platform? Yeah, the main reason was that we needed a great, great control and great flexibility over our infrastructure and how we do certain things like basically the remote code execution. Mm -hmm. So we had like certain requirements when we want to like analyze an answer to a question, how we want to like interact with data sets we have. So we had like think of from uh, think of that from the first principles and uh, go from there. Yeah, so that's the main reason. And that allows us to like, you know, uh, how, you know, better features and uh, improvements uh, without relying on a third party Correct. because this is a core component. Right. And uh, since we control everything, we know exactly how it works. Mm -hmm. So there is no hidden magic. So we want to do it ourselves because yeah. it was a very niche requirement of the platform. And also we, you know, we didn't want to only have one or two programming languages mm -hmm. or options. We wanted to have multiple and add more in the future. And so some of these only had MySQL. And I was like, well, when I started out, I learned Microsoft SQL Server, but also, you know, I then had to learn MySQL later. I don't just want people to be able to practice in one type of SQL. I want it to be multiple and almost no other, uh, no product out there had all of them. But then if you wanted to add extra ones, sometimes they didn't have the ones that were like, oh, in the future, we know we'll want to add that. So we, like you said, we we now have complete control. We can build out and add anything we want. Whereas before it would have been very limiting to what we could have done on the platform. Um, and so that was a big, one of the bigger reasons as well that we just, I didn't want to put all my faith in another <laughs> product that could go out, they could go out of business or they could, you know, not do things the way that we wanted to do it with checking an answer or take, uh, reading in a data set or something like that. Yeah, so that's the first thing we built actually. So I think it stayed almost the same after then. Mm -hmm. So it didn't change much. Yeah, yeah. And it's it's one of my favorite parts of the whole platform. I mean, the courses are great, but being able to run the code and practice it while you're taking the course is just awesome. And, and it looks amazing. It feels amazing. It does it almost instantly. Um, it's, it, it is like the core, the heart of the of the platform, really. Yeah. Um, so that is the infrastructure of Analyst Builder. Now we talked uh, about a lot of different things, um, but that is that is the core of you know the platform in and of itself. It it is very complex, as you can kind of tell. We use a lot of different tools, systems, um, you know, third party applications, and it's very very complex. Um, like I was saying before. This did not happen overnight. We didn't know that these were the right tools for us. We, it was, some of them were trial and error. <laughs> like they just didn't work when we tried to do another tool. And then we were like, okay, let's look for something else that can do this piece. And then we found something better. 
Um, and so a lot of these things that we're talking about, and I'll put those in the description so you can kind of look at them. A lot of these things were, you know, we had to make the mistake first and then figure it out. Or we were looking for something very specific that not everybody had and we had to like search for it and find it. And so um, over that year, I mean, it was a lot of learning. <laughs> it was a lot of learning. Um, but that is a lot of the infrastructure and a lot of the things that we'll be building on for the future of uh, Analyst Builder. And we have a lot of things planned, like a lot of new things that will be building on this infrastructure. So maybe in a year or two years, we'll have to remake this video. Yeah. Because I think we'll have a lot of additional things um, that aren't currently in the platform that we're going to be adding very soon. So that is our entire video on the infrastructure of Analyst Builder. Hope you enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed this entire series. It was a three-part series with Kasoon himself, the genius behind it all. So with that being said, thank you guys so much for watching. Be sure to go and check out Analyst Builder. It is a fantastic platform. And check out all the other videos that I have on my YouTube channel.